Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you found where you're supposed to be. Nobody got lost. Or too lost, except for the people I pull out of the hall. So that's okay. We're glad you're here. I think our coming in here has scared off the thunderstorms for now. So that's a very good point. If you wanted to understand the concept of superfluous, right now, me in this moment, that pretty much gives you what you need right now. My job is to introduce Wayne Mott. Cut me up right. <laughs> if there's somebody who needs no introduction, of course it's Wayne. And so here's where I was going to do the mic drop and walk off. <laughs> but, you know, we do this to each other all the time. I don't think I have to tell this audience, but I'm going to anyway, how glad we should all be that we have a president with vision, with commitment, with capacity, and with common sense to help lead this organization into the future, to do good work, and to uh, live up to all the promise uh, that our, our mission statement uh, puts out there. We are a preservation and an education organization. We want to keep doing those things and do them better and do more of them. We needed some kind of direction. And uh, well, somebody had to set the command climate uh, for this organization to move us forward. And Wayne Moss is the guy who's done that. We're all on board, those of us who are associated and affiliated with the organization. We hope that you're going to follow us down the line. Many of you are already members of the Gettysburg Foundation. If you are not, before you leave this building, you go over to the Friends Desk and sign up. <laughs> or I am coming Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me back there? I'll try to. I know it's probably be loud because I got a really loud voice. So I'll try to do. I'll try what I what I can do to lower this down. I want to thank all of you for being here this afternoon, Carol. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Thanks to all the the staff and the common sense was, hey, we ought to move this indoors because we think we're gonna have a storm. So I don't know if that was a good call or a bad call, but we thought we ought to bring it in here to make sure we just didn't get run out of that tent, ladies and gentlemen. And people out here, uh, one of our philanthropy staff was out here and somebody came up and said, this is the line, is this the line for Wayne Mott? So I said, I only wish it was the line. <laughs> uh, for don't beat Stephen Lang when you're, <laughs> uh, when you're outside. So it's just, it's wonderful. I thank you, all of you for being here. And I'm just so honored uh, to lead this organization. I've got a great staff of people working uh, with us, for us, and also the National Park Service is our partner. So thank you, and thank you for all the support. I always like to do very unique programs. So the things that I like to come up with are things that people really haven't heard of. If you remember last year, I did a presentation on a trooper that fought at East Calvary Field that was with George Armstrong Custer that died on the Titanic. And, uh, and that is posted on YouTube and you can see it uh, on the YouTube channel for the Gettysburg Foundation. All of the programs we're doing for Sacred Trust, we're not streaming the live, but they will be on YouTube. We will be putting those up. So this year I thought, you know, wouldn't it be pretty interesting if we tried to find some connections between Fort Sumter, the opening shots of the American Civil War, and the greatest battle of the American Civil War. And all of you that are Gettysburg aficionados, you know right away, hey, look, there's some famous connections of people that were here at Gettysburg that are at Fort Sumter. And we're not going to talk about them today. Uh, <laughs> We're going to give you some connections that you have never heard of with Fort Sumter and Gettysburg. And I've got a slide of the ones that you have heard of, just so you can see their faces. But that's not what we're going to focus on today. This will also not be a battle talk. We're not going to give a blow-by-blow -blow account of what happened at Fort Sumter, both on the firing of the Star of the West in January 1861, we'll talk a little bit about it, and also the bombardment, of course, on April 12 or 13, nor the fighting of these men at Gettysburg, but we're gonna give you a comparative so you can see where these folks are at. Some of these people we're talking about went all the way to Appomattox. They were at the opening shots of the Civil War 
and they ended the Civil War at Appomattox. For those of you that know me, the two most important things every time I give a talk are what are the stories I'm going to tell. It's always important to me. Being a battlefield guide for many, many years, my mentors, all battlefield guides, got a couple in the room here today, they knew early, tell stories if you want to get people interested in the Civil War. That's what we do here at the Foundation. That's what I'm going to do here today. So I'm always concerned about what stories I'm going to tell. And there's a lot more I could tell with what I'm actually able to tell. So I have to kind of weed out which ones am I going to tell, which ones am I not going to tell. And the second thing that always is concerning to me is who I'm going to dedicate this program to. And I really thought hard about this one. So, and I want to dedicate this program to a friend of mine related to a Fort Sumter connection to the Battle of Gettysburg that all of you know. You probably know Samuel Wiley Crawford, who was here commanding the Pennsylvania Reserves at Little Round Top, was the assistant surgeon at Fort Sumter. And many, many years ago, the Pennsylvania legislation passed to put five Pennsylvania commanders, put their statues on the battlefield, and only three of those Pennsylvania commanders were ever erected. Two, and that included John Gibbon and Samuel Wiley Crawford, were not erected, and they were not dedicated or erected until 1988. And the statue of Samuel Wiley Crawford, who commanded Pennsylvania Reserve Division, was dedicated in the Valley of the Death, below Little Round Top, 160 years ago, and that would be uh, today, right? July, no, June 25th, June 25th. John Gibbon was dedicated 160 years ago today. Samuel Wiley Crawford was assistant surgeon inside Fort Sumter. He's one of the connections we're, gonna not, we're not gonna talk about, but because he's connected to Fort Sumter, I'd like to dedicate this program to the sculptor of the Samuel Wiley Crawford statue, Ron Tunison of Cairo, New York. Now this was once a man, everybody. So you know, right here. And so this is Wayne Motts, the first day he ever wore a Battlefield Guide uniform. 35 years ago this week, 35 years ago. And there's the statue. <laughs> there's the monument being unveiled right there behind you. When I had lots of hair, it all turned gray when I went to Harrisburg. It didn't get gray hair here, everybody, uh, when I was there. Ron was such a great man. He died 10 years ago uh, from Cairo, New York. He sculpted several of the memorials on the Gettysburg battlefield, the friend to friend Masonic Memorial, Elizabeth Thorne that's over in the National Cemetery, Samuel Wiley Crawford, of course, it's here, the Delaware Memorial. Uh, and then he died unexpectedly at 66 years of age. But because he sculpted this on June 25th, and I met him, was introduced to him the first day that I led a Battlefield Guide tour, I'm going to dedicate it to Ron Tunison uh, here today. What a, great, uh, what a great friend he was, and we're sorry we lost him. What great his artwork lives on on the Gettysburg Battlefield when you go. What you probably don't know is that both of the artillery units, there were two artillery units stationed inside Fort Sumter when South Carolina left the Union on December 20th, 1860. And both of those artillery units were at the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, they're not lugging around big, huge 40-pound guns, everybody, 42-pound guns, right? They're light artillery units here in the Battle of Gettysburg, but at Fort Sumter, they were heavy artillery units. One of the batteries, Batteries H, 1st U.S. Artillery, is stationed at the cemetery. That is right here. The cemetery tablet is very close to where Abraham Lincoln actually spoke. This battery is under the command, it says it right here, Chandler Eakin, and he was wounded here in the Battle of Gettysburg on July 2nd and 3rd, 1863. This is a unit in the cannonade before Pickett's Charge. And on December 20th, 1860, the day South Carolina left the Union, this artillery unit is at Fort Moultrie and then goes over to Fort Sumter. So in the bombardment on April 13, 12 and 13, this unit is inside Fort Sumter. Here is the position on Cemetery Hill. You go out there, you can visit this today. And this artillery battery at Fort Sumter was commanded by future Union General Truman Seymour, Battery H, 1st U.S. Artillery. The second unit that was at Fort Sumter, also inside uh, Fort Sumter, Fort Moultrie, and then went over to Fort Sumter, is Battery E, 
first U.S. artillery. And at Gettysburg, it was combined with Batteries G, and it was stationed at East Cavalry Field with George Armstrong Custer against Jeb Stuart. So this battery, and you can see the location of where it is here, and this actually, one section of it will be involved with Custer along where the Low Dutch Road is. They have two monuments over on the battlefield with these battlefield plaques. You probably know many of the units that fought at Gettysburg are in the volunteer service, but we do have units that fought in the Battle of Gettysburg that are in the U.S. Regular Army Service. And both of these artillery units in the U.S. Regular Army Service at the opening of Fort Sumter, but also at the Battle of Gettysburg. So I got the idea, wouldn't it be really cool if I could look at the payrolls of who was inside Fort Sumter in 1861, and then go to the National Archives and look at the payrolls and see who's in the Battle of Gettysburg and match the two for these two artillery units. Would you believe that in the battery that's on Cemetery Hill, there are at least 17 men that were inside Fort Sumter that were also at Gettysburg? And there were about eight or nine men that were at East Calvary Field that show up on the payroll being paid at Fort Sumter that are also being paid at Gettysburg. And so you could actually come up with these names and look at them. And this is the original muster roll for Fort Sumter. Now, the troops get paid every other month. This muster roll dates to April 30th, 1861. And since Fort Sumter is evacuated and these troops are sent up to New York, it's actually done at New York, this muster and payroll. And these are a listing by rank and then alphabetical order for the, for the privates. And so just to show you sort of what I did, I pulled this muster roll, I photographed it, and you can go down the muster roll and you can see John Comedy right there. He's a sergeant inside Fort Sumter in 1861. Here is a close-up of him. And I didn't put the slide in, but he also appears as being paid on June 30th, 1863, when this battery is paid and here in the Gettysburg campaign. So right there, there, there's a man that is at Fort Sumter, and he's also here in the Battle of Gettysburg. So we could have given you a lot of different stories about these people, but we only picked out a few because we also relate to, well, who do we have a photograph of? Who can we wrap a story around? One or two of these we don't have images of. We're still going to talk about that. But we could have put a story together on any one of these 17 men or any one of the nine, eight or nine men that came out from these two artillery batteries. Now, here's the people that you all know. So if you come to Gettysburg and you say, who's at Fort Sumter that's in the Battle of Gettysburg for the opening shots of the Civil War? These are all people you know. Norman Hall, Michigan commander in Pickett's Charge in the Battle of Gettysburg. A young officer, graduate of West Point, right at Fort Sumter at the opening shots of the Civil War. Doubleday commands Battery E of the 1st United States Artillery, which is under Randall out at East Calvary Field. So he's the battery commander uh, in Fort Sumter. And Samuel Crawford is the assistant surgeon. And James Johnson Pettigrew, as a Confederate, was an aide to General Pickens. He also commanded some infantry units at Fort Sumter. And of course, he is a Confederate division commander in Pickett's charge, mortally wounded later on in the retreat and dies coming out here. All of these connections here are people that you all know about. And guess what? Connections we're not going to talk about. Let's take a look. Thanks to American Battlefield Trust uh, for this wonderful, wonderful map. So this is Fort Sumter. Fort Sumter is built in Charleston Harbor. The construction begins on it in 1829. And at the outbreak of the American Civil War, ladies and gentlemen, it's not finished. They're still working on it. An artificial reef is created in the shipping channel of Charleston Harbor just so they can bring ships in here. And they want to put a fort here as part of the third systems of forts after the British burn Washington, D.C. Congress decides after British burn Washington, D.C. during the War of 1812, probably not a good thing, right? We better have some harbor defenses, and we better build some forts for the harbor defenses. And that's exactly what Fort Sumter becomes. They bring in rocks to make an artificial island to bring Fort Sumter up there, and it has bricks. It is a brick five-sided fortification, and at the outbreak of the American Civil War, it was not yet finished. Fully garrisoned, fully garrisoned, this would have about 650 men. It's nowhere near that at the outbreak of the Civil War. Now, there's also some surrounding forts. Fort Moultrie, which is over here on Sullivan Island, 
Fort Johnson, which is over here on James Island, and then Cummings Point, which is on Morris Island. This is the very famous Morris Island where Battery Wagner is in 1863 and the 54th Massachusetts that charges there and tries to take Battery Wagner when the Confederates are here in July of 1863. So part of that history continues on. Charleston is right here and it is actually separated by the Ashley River and the Cooper River and there are at least 19 wharfs along the Cooper River side where you would receive goods in trade at the time of the American Civil War. Remember, if you're living in the United States at the time of the American Civil War, you probably don't have any, any action with the federal government except in your daily lives, except for mail service. And unless you live in a port city where they collect duties and taxes, you also don't have any interaction with the federal government. So basically the US mail, that's your interaction with the federal government, and collection of duty and taxes if you live in a port city like you do here uh, in the Charleston area. Charleston, a very important city at the time of the American Civil War. Tredegar, the iron works in Richmond, producing a lot of works. You've got this right down here, Charleston, very important for the Confederate cause here. So this is what it actually looks like. And then let me show you what it looks like from uh, a Google Earth view. Here's Fort Sumter today. How many people have been to Fort Sumter? You've been to Fort Sumter? Oh, wow, great portion of people in the room. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about it. So you can see Morris Island right here, Fort Johnson right over here on James Island, and then Fort Moultrie over here on Sullivan. You want to get in this channel and go down here to the Cooper River, Ashley River, you've got to go past all of these batteries that are right here. The lighthouse here on Morris Island, we're going to talk a little bit about it, would be down here. If you go to Morris Island today, the only way you can get there is by boat. And the lighthouse that was out on the island is now, it was a mile from the water, is now underwater, where the ocean has creeped into it, if you actually see it. This lighthouse that was here for Charleston at Morris Island, one of the connections we're going to talk about was stationed there. So just keep, stay tuned, uh, stay tuned on that. This is a view of Fort Sumter by Seth uh, Eastman. It's from the Library of Congress. This is what it actually looked like on this artificial shoal. And the boats would pull up and go inside here. It was a five-sided fortification. It was three tiers. And it was to have artillery on each of these levels. It's never finished. And by the time Major Anderson, the commanding officer, puts people here in 1861, this is a place that's supposed to have 650 people. How many are actually here? Uh, garrisoning it during the bombardment, slightly over 100 people. And not all of them are in the military, which we'll talk about. Beautiful color image from the Library of Congress. Here is a view of the wharf of what it looks like today. Here's the five-sided fort of Fort Sumter as an aerial view, the, the artificial reef that's created out here, it's very isolated. The only way you can get to it is by boat. You all know that if you have been there. And today they have a different uh, type of wharf that's connected here for the tourist boats that pull up to it. During the Civil War, you pulled up right here in front of where these rocks are to go into the front part, uh, into the front part of the building. And this is Wayne Motz's image. How could you uh, study the Civil War as long as I had and never have been to Fort Sumter until 10 years ago? So I was not there till 10 years ago, but what do you do right before the anniversary of Gettysburg for, uh, you know, for the 150th? You show up at Fort Sumter so you can have talk about the fighting before. This is an image that I made of Fort Sumter from the tourist boat actually going out to Fort Sumter. And today it's a much reduced fort. It's been modified for World War I. World War II looks a lot different than it did at the time of the American Civil War. So that's one, of, that's one of the images that I photographed. Now, remember the history. Lincoln is elected president November, early November, 1860. South Carolina will leave the Union on December 20th, 1860. And the question is, what are we gonna do with the federal possessions that are inside Charleston Harbor? Now, Fort Pickens, is at Pensacola, Florida. And Fort Pickens is sort of in the same situation Fort Sumter is, but it doesn't nearly get the attention that Fort Sumter does because South Carolina immediately goes out of the Union. Deep South later follows. But South Carolina wants to buy the forts around Charleston Harbor. They want to buy Fort Moultrie or have them transferred. Get Charleston Harbor transferred, Fort Johnson. Get all those transferred out of, what, out of the United States 
and into the sovereign state of South Carolina and then later into the Confederacy. Of course, you're James Buchanan. You're sitting up as president. Remember back in those days, the president doesn't get inaugurated on January 20th. The president gets inaugurated on March 4th which means that James Buchanan is a long-time lame duck. He's going all the way from November, clear up in there to March, and what is he going to do? You're, you're out at Fort Moultrie. You're completely surrounded by everybody who hates you if you're in the United States garrison there. So what the heck are you, are you supposed to do? The original commander here is a northerner from Boston, Massachusetts. So if you want to further inflame the indigenous personnel, right? <laughs> Everybody who lives in Charleston, make sure you got a Yankee that's in charge down there. That's what you don't want to have. And that's actually what happened. John Gardner, John L. Gardner was a professional soldier. He was the commanding officer of Fort Moultrie, right across from Fort Sumter. When, uh, right, uh, when Lincoln was elected into office there, and he wants the fort reinforced. And, of course, John Floyd, the Secretary of War, who happens to be a Southerner, he later becomes a Confederate general, is scheming to try to figure out how can we turn over Fort Sumter and get it into the hands of the Confederacy. He eventually resigns, becomes Secretary of War for the Confederacy, becomes a general officer there. And so Gardner is a guy that you want to try to get replaced. Buchanan actually replaces him with someone that he thinks is going to be a little bit more friendlier, at least optically, to all the people that are in South Carolina. And that officer is the officer that moves the garrison from Fort Moultrie over to Fort Sumter. And that officer is also the officer involved in the bombardment of Fort Sumter. And that is Major Robert Anderson. Both of these men are career military officers. Gardner was born in 1793. He's in his 60s at the outbreak of the American Civil War. He is a veteran of the War of 1812 and also the Mexican War. Robert Anderson graduates from West Point in 1825, is an artillery instructor, very well known in the Army. His native place is the state of Kentucky, and he was a slave owner, and he also married a very prominent woman from a very important family from the state of Georgia. So if you're the president, James Buchanan, and you want to try to optically make it look better to have a commander of Fort Sumter that might be a little bit more friendly, you're going to end up appointing Robert Anderson, and that's what happens. Well, Anderson is a professional soldier down to the core. How would you like to get those orders? You're Robert Anderson. You know the whole weight of the war is going to be on your shoulders. And he gets assigned and shows up in Charleston on November 19, 31 days before uh, South Carolina will leave uh, the Union and eventually, of course, join the Confederacy. So Robert Anderson is going to be the head there as an artillery instructor, very important guy. And then here is a photograph that was taken. Now, Admiral Doubleday has a lot of writings about Fort Sumter. He did a Reminiscences book in 1876, Reminiscences of Moultrie and Sumter. You can download it on Google Books if you want to. And he says in his Reminiscences that this photograph, these are not, th th uh, this photograph shows nine of the officers that were at Fort Sumter. There's at least one that isn't in this image. And Admiral Doubleday, uh, is right here. Robert Anderson is right here. Uh, so he says this was taken on the 8th of February, but this would have been the officer corps here in April of 1861. And like I said, one of the officers ends up joining later. Now, what did the garrison look like at Fort Sumter at the time of the Civil War? Our Gettysburg guys involved in this, and we'll talk about it. Had about 10 officers, five of the headquarters staff, the battery of artillery. This should have been about 100 guys. It had 32 men in Battery E, according to the materials that we had. 31 men in Battery H, under True and Seymour's command. One hospital staff, 38 laborers, mechanics, and workers. Two cooks for about 119 men. And none of these numbers, I should tell everybody, none of them are very hard numbers. Now, you're down there at Fort Sumter. You're going to move from Fort Moultrie over to Fort Sumter, and Robert Anderson makes that move. Boy, the South Carolinians don't like it. And he makes it on December 26, the day after Christmas, 1860. And he will move across to Fort Sumter. Now he's sort of isolated inside Fort Sumter. And in January, the President of the United States has got to figure out, do we send reinforcements down there? Do we send troops down there? What do we send down there? 
And of course, every one of these actions, there's no playbook as to what the right actions are going to be. And any action taken could provoke hostilities. When Anderson is assigned here to Fort Sumter, he's told, whatever you do, do not start a civil war. Don't fire first. Somebody else has got to fire. Somebody else has got to fire first. Well, Buchanan, along with the Secretary of War, a guy named Holt at this time, because Floyd has resigned, will decide to send a merchant steamer down there to try to reinforce uh, Fort Sumter. This is going to be looked upon terribly, of course, if you're a South Carolinian. And this steamer is called the Star of the West. It's not a military ship. It is a, a merchant steamer. And about 250 or so, about 250 recruits, brand new recruits, are going to be put on the Star of the West and they're going to sail in early January 1861 down to Fort Sumter with the intended mission to relieve the fort that is there. Now, these recruits have a lot of people in them. Well, it's interesting because one of the men fighting here in the wheat field on July 2nd, 1863, is a recruit on the Star of the West. And his name is Daniel Loosely. And loosely, we'll tell you a little bit about him. First of all, this photograph right there is from the New London Historical Society. It is an unpublished colorized image of him that I got directly from him. Nobody's ever seen an image of him. This is as a first lieutenant. This would have been what he would have looked like in the Battle of Gettysburg. He's in Company E, 1st Battalion, 14th United States Infantry Regiment, here in the Battle of Gettysburg. He's born in Buckinghamshire, England. He's born in January 1833. But I, I don't know uh, exactly the date of his birth. He came to the United States in about 1851. So he tells us he was about 18 years old. And he enlisted in the Army in Company C, the 4th United States Infantry Regiment. This is the same infantry regiment that President Ulysses Simpson Grant is a member of in the Pacific Northwest. And they send Lucy out to the Pacific Northwest. And believe it or not, he is assigned to San Juan Island, which is in Washington State, disputed by the British and by the United States. If you remember your history, in 1859, a pig was shot on, <laughs> on San Juan Island. There was a dispute as to who would pay for it. The English had one half and the United States had the other half. And they sent George Pickett in the 9th United States Infantry Regiment out there and put him on this island and almost started a war called the Pig War. And it was over this pig, over the boundary dispute, as to where Canada comes in and where the United States comes in. Well, believe it or not, Loosely is in the 4th Infantry and he is assigned to San Juan Island. His enlistment is up. They have five-year enlistments in the, in the Civil War service. The enlistment is up in 1860. Look when it's up. It's up uh, in March of 1860, and he gets passage on a boat to go down the Isthmus of Panama to go back to New York, and then he will re-enlist in the service on December 3rd, 1860. The moment he enlists in the service, they put him at Governor's Island, New York, and he gets the orders as a brand new recruit, having already served one term in the Army, to get on the Star of the West and sail down <laughs> to uh, Charleston, South Carolina. So he is actually on the Star of the West as an enlisted soldier. Then he will get a commission in November of 1861. As it says, he will be a first lieutenant fighting in the wheat field at Gettysburg. He will... Uh, leave the service in 1867. He will make his home in New London, Connecticut. He marries a woman from New London, Connecticut. And he dies in 1922. So he's almost in his 90th year. He's about 89 years old when he actually dies here. And I was fascinated because when I got found this image, found out that, that he had an image in New London, they also sent me actual photographic copies of his 1861 journal. And this is it right here. And if you look down here, it actually says, boarded the steamer Star of the West. After delightful passage of three or four days, we reached the vicinity of Charleston Harbor and made an attempt uh, to get into Fort Sumter. Rebel batteries opened on the ship from Morris Island. He describes all of that. Let me see if I can get my glasses off. Uh, and had a real lively time for about an hour, during which time 19 shots were fired at the ship, there of which struck, or three of which struck the ship. No damage, however. 
And he goes on to say, I had the honor of seeing the first shot fired in the Civil War. So he's on the Star of the West. It is shot at. It struck several times, although there isn't a lot of damage. The date of this is January 9, 1861, and the Star of the West turns around and goes back up to York. In some people's books, you would call that the start of the Civil War, ladies and gentlemen, right? But one of the battlefield guides here, Ed Guy, my mentor, the reason why I'm a battlefield guide, he's a South Carolinian. And Ed knows every story here at Gettysburg. I'm convinced of it. And I told Ed Guy, you know what? I found this Union soldier named Daniel Loosley that was on the Star of the West. I said, you got to find me somebody that's at Morris Island that shoots at the Star of the West that's at the Battle of Gettysburg. He found me three men. <laughs> three, just like that. So... There's, so now I got a man from, from Gettysburg that's on the Star of the West. Now I got somebody shooting at him on the Star of the West. By the way, let's show you where Daniel Loosley's grave. He's buried in Cedar Grove Cemetery in New London, Connecticut. We vi visited his grave. This is a picture of his grave. He was in the stationary business uh, after the American Civil War. A couple of the Gettysburg officers are in this, uh, in this grave, many of them associated uh, with the 14th, uh, 14th U.S. Infantry Regiment because its rendezvous was Fort Trumbull, Connecticut. Where was it recruited? Where were people at? Right here in New London. So this is Loosley's grave when he died in 1922 there. Now, let's talk about who's shooting at him. One of the three men that is on Morris Island, manned by the Confederates, is a colonel of the 12th Alabama Infantry Regiment on Oak Hill, in the Battle of Gettysburg. And his name is Samuel Bonner. How do you pronounce that? Somebody's good with French. You can do better than I can. Samuel, uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'll fix it. Samuel B. Pickett. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> and he's the commanding officer of the 12th U.S. Great image of him as a cadet at the South Carolina Military Ca Academy, at which is now called the Citadel. So Pickens was born July 8, 1839, so he's only in his uh, early 20s when he fires on the Star of the West. He was educated at the Citadel, was a distinguished graduate there the year the Civil War broke out. And er late in December, early in January, the Citadel will send cadets out to Cummings Point, out to Morris Island, to man the artillery battery there, about 1,200 yards off of Fort Sumter, and they will be the ones that are going to fire on the Star of the West. Pickens actually is reported to have fired the second shot, loosely just told you three of them, hit the boat. He reportedly fired the second shot here. He gets a commission, goes into Alabama service, becomes a colonel, and he is, as I mentioned, a commanding officer in O'Neill's brigade up onto Oak Hill. He is wounded at least four times in the American Civil War, and he dies in 1891. Now, here is a picture of the Citadel. It used to be in Marion Square in downtown uh, Charleston, of course, and they've got commemorations to it. What's really interesting about it, here's the shooting. So there's the Star of the West. This is a Harper's Weekly illustration. This is the cadet battery here with the big red the flag that the South Carolinians from the Citadel actually flew. And they're firing on the Star of the West as loosely tells us about it. Now, today, and here's a painting of it too from the library, wonderful colorized painting from the Citadel Library there for the, on the January 9, 1861 at the Star of the West. If you are a graduate of the Citadel today, the opening shots of the American Civil War are still commemorated, are still memorialized on the ring of every Citadel graduate. The rings of the Citadel graduates still bear the Star of the West. Rob Abbott, my colleague, he is right here. He's got a ring on his finger from the Citadel. You can go out and actually get a live finger. Make sure you keep your finger on there, Rob. <laughs> But I got, I got a picture of it. Rob can tell you all about it. Here's the grave of Pickens in Cathedral Cemetery in Charleston. He died in 1891, one of the youngest colonels of the Army. He was a railroad uh, man after the war. And right here is the ring of the Citadel, 1842, the South Carolina Military College. And you can see right there the Star of the West on the side of the ring that Rob has on his finger right now. And every graduate from the Citadel Still, Star of the West, 
still remembered from the opening shots of the American Civil War in 1861. So there you go. You had somebody on the Star of the West, a relief ship going down to Fort Sumter, was in the Union Army here in the Wheat Field as an officer, and you have a Confederate officer stationed at Morris Island, South Carolina, firing at the ship. Now, the bombardment is April 12 and 13, 1861. Goes on for 34 hours. The opening shots of the American Civil War started when the South Carolinians, South Carolinians, excuse me, make that opening bombardment at 4:30 in the morning on April 12, 1861. One of the soldiers there, a sergeant, was William Harn, and at Gettysburg. Harn actually commands the 3rd New York Independent Artillery Battery that you have passed thousands of times on your drives around Gettysburg. And you didn't realize that the man in charge of it was not only Gettysburg, but he was inside Fort Sumter. And he is a member of Battery E, 3rd US, uh, 1st U.S. Artillery. This is from the New York State Military Museum, a blown up image. This is a reunion image from Gettysburg. I I've never seen uh, another image of Captain Harn, Brevet Major Harn. This is a post-war photograph of William Harn on the reunion grouping for the veterans. And this is dated 1889, and it's interesting because that is the exact year that Harn died. So I don't know when this image was taken. He is in Battery E, 1st U.S., and he's also in Battery H. He, he at one time is in both batteries that were inside Fort Sumter. But he actually gets a volunteer commission and is serving in Gettysburg, not as a member of Battery H or E of the 1st U.S. Artillery, but as a volunteer officer here in the Battle of Gettysburg. So this is a little bit uh, about, about his history uh, here. So he's born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1834, and he had an enlistment in 1854, re-enlisted in 1859, and he's at Fort Mon uh, Moultrie in Fort Sumter, and then he gets this volunteer commission. Now, Harn married the daughter of the ordnance sergeant of Fort Sumter. And so her name uh, is Skillen. James Skillen was the ordnance sergeant of Fort Sumter and also Castle Pickney. And Harn actually moves down to South Carolina. After the war, he becomes a merchant. He stays there for a little while. And then he is assigned to a lighthouse, joins the U.S. Lighthouse Service, and guess what lighthouse he's assigned to, the one at Morris Island, South Carolina, the very place that the South Carolinians shot at him inside Fort Sumter. He's light keeper there. Then he gets shipped down to St. Augustine, Florida. He's there very early in the history of St. Augustine, Florida, and he actually uh, dies at St. Augustine, Florida. But that's, that's what the lighthouse looked like, the original lighthouse of Morris Island. Today, it's got a beautiful, what a standard lighthouse may look like. When Harden was there, this is what the lighthouse actually looked like when he was there right after the outbreak of the Civil War. Now, you're searching your mind. Where is the third New York independent battery in the Battle of Gettysburg? Where is Harn at? He's right next to the cemetery. You park at the Maryland Monument. It's the monument right across the street from the National Cemetery. So he's, and, get, and guess where the, one of the batteries he served in is where? Right at the top of Cemetery Hill. Probably knows people in that battery. Battery H, or first U.S. artillery. This is Harn's battery in the Battle of Gettysburg, the monument to it. It had three different positions. It was in the Sixth Corps artillery here in the Battle of Gettysburg. Sixth Corps Artillery Brigade here in the Battle of Gettysburg. Here's the original lighthouse at St. Augustine, Florida, where Harn was the light keeper. This lighthouse, by the way, was taken away in a storm in 1880. Today, there's a beautiful white and black striped lighthouse that's at St. Augustine, Florida, uh, if you've been down there. And Harn today, this would have been, this is the restored light keeper house. This is uh, from Davis Construction. The people that restored it was destroyed in a fire in 1870. And then Harn and his family lived in here. Now, when you're in the lighthouse service, there's usually one or two, maybe three people that are with you on these isolated places, wherever you're at. The main light keeper usually had his family, assistant light keeper, and at least one of them was usually a single man. So usually had three or four, uh, you might have three families inside here at any one time. That's why it looks really big. But this burned up in a fire in 1870, and then it was restored. Our William Harn at Gettysburg, light keeper, St. Augustine, Florida. And that is where he is buried today. This is out of the, out of the uh, morning news at Savannah, Georgia. This is his grave. 
in St. Augustine. He dies in 1889. That's there. Now, one of my favorite stories has got to be high on the list. So we're only giving you a couple stories here. One of my favorite stories has got to be James Chester. I don't have a photograph of James Chester. I looked everywhere. There's got to be... I was, my friend, Bob O'Neill, I want to thank him so much. He's up here in the front of the room. Bob uh, has done a heck of a lot of research. He gave the first presentation of Sacred Trust on small but important riots on the cavalry action in Aldi Middleburg and Upperville, a good friend of mine for many years. And he and I were looking at similar records at the National Archives, and I asked Bob if he could help run down some records for me. He's helped contribute to this, and Bob, I really, really, really appreciate it. There's got to be a photograph of Chester somewhere because he's commanding officer at the artillery school. Now, he's in Battery E, 1st United States Artillery Regiment, which is commanded by Captain Randall on East Cavalry Field with George Armstrong Custer. This battery had four guns at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg, and Chester is inside Fort Sumter as a sergeant with this battery. This is his service record, which is very, very interesting. He's born in 1834. We do know the date of his birth, uh, the 10th of February. It's on his gravestone at Arlington National Cemetery, and the newspaper says that he is a graduate of the University of Aberdeen from Scotland. Like many of the regular Army officers that are here in the Battle of Gettysburg, many of them are foreign-born. Uh, both Loosley and Chester had served in the ranks, and then they both got commissions in, uh, into the regular service, which was not uncommon at the time of the Civil War, because you've got to have a lot of extra people uh, to command the, the unit says, yeah, I've got attrition. Everybody's going into the volunteer service. So he enlisted in 1854 in Baltimore. His uh, occupation was paper maker. He re-enlisted at Moultrie, and then he's in the bombardment, and he gets a commission right before the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, his commission, ladies and gentlemen, is in the 3rd U.S. Artillery. 3rd U.S. Artillery. Wouldn't you know that in the Battle of Gettysburg, James Chester gets orders to go to East Cavalry Field, he actually commands before that, but he is at East Cavalry Field commanding two guns, a section of that against Jeb Stewart, detached from the 3rd Artillery, and it is the same battery he's inside Fort Sumter with. So he's commanding a unit that all the troops that are in that battery are people that he would have known, people that he knew, at least the old service of people that's there. So he's serving in the same battery at Gettysburg that he served at <laughs> at Fort Sumter. That's there. And he's going to serve with that until the end of the war. He's going to retire with the rank of major. He'll be mandatorily retired at the age of 64 in 1898 after 44 years of continuous service. And this is a fitness report that was pulled that dates to two years before he's retired when he is 62 years of age in 1896. And it has it all this, excellent. Professional ability, excellent. But you go down near the bottom and it says this officer is 62 years of age and weighs 260 pounds. <laughs> Probably not favorable, or but not for field service, it says. Not for field service. This is an image that Bob gave me. So <laughs> Chester... You know, he spends 44, you know, 44 years in the service, and age is caught up with him. He's not able to go out in the active field service. This is what he wrote in 1866, where he gives his record in the Civil War. He talks about being at Aldi, Middleburg, or Aldi and Upperville, excuse me, and then at Gettysburg and Shepherdstown. So he's specific, and he talks about commanded a section of, of the battery, and, and this would be Battery E, which is E and G of the 1st United States Artillery here in the Battle of Gettysburg. This is actually all in his own hand out of one of his files. This is unpublished, too, from the National Archives as one of the images that's there. Now, he's in the service an awful long time. Like many of the members in the service, volunteer or regulars, many of these men actually have PTSD, have other mental health needs and issues, and here is an article out of the newspaper, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, that dates to 1889, where it says that uh, at 4.30 in the morning, a man rushed into the South Ferry ticket office, threw down a letter, and he basically says that, that people are after him. And he had dreams, and he, basically, he gets committed. He's hauled away by uh, civilian authorities, 
The military deals with this, but it appears that he has some sort of mental breakdown here. Uh, and he talks about it. goes on and says, uh, the captain will be in the service 35 years, has been ill of late, and the tomb corps today met Captain Randolph on Governor's Island to take him back to his quarters. So he does retire out of the regular service. This doesn't uh, appear to affect his career. He stays in the military. He's not really active field. So he goes to some universities, goes to like University of Iowa, and is like in the uh, instruction program there, like you and I would almost call it like today, almost like an ROTC program. But James Chester, career military officer inside Fort Sumter as a sergeant of uh, Battery E, 1st United States Artillery, gets commissioned, goes to East Cavalry Field to command the same battery and group of men that he was with inside Fort Sumter. Imagine that, what the irony of that is. And then uh, he'll die in 1903. He'll be buried in Arlington National Cemetery. And I want you to look. I included this because I want you to look who one of his pallbearers is. If I know who Frederick Fugger is, Fugger is in Cushing's battery at the Battle of Gettysburg. He's the first sergeant, and he is a holder of the Medal of Honor for the Battle of Gettysburg. And he is a pallbearer in 1903 at the death of uh, Major Chester. Also, Royal T. Frank. Frank was an officer at Gettysburg. Who else, Carol? You probably know. You know a lot. <laughs> A lot of these have got, there's a lot of interesting officers in there that were called to be pallbearers at Chester's funeral here. So today, what did you hear about? Fort Sumter to Gettysburg connections that you never knew. Daniel Loosley, who's on the Star of the West, who shows three shots were fired. Samuel Pickens, who's at Morris Island as a cadet for the Citadel that fires uh, at, at that. You've got... Uh, uh, you've got James Chester uh, that's here. Who else? Who did I miss? William right, William Harn. Thank you. So we've got four folks here, uh, four folks that you just heard at Gettysburg that you probably never knew were at Fort Sumter and the two artillery batteries inside Fort Sumter that are actually here in the Battle of Gettysburg, still in the, in the regular artillery. Interesting connections to the battle. Always stories to be told, ladies and gentlemen. And I like to tell a good story. Everybody knows this. Carol mentioned we really appreciate uh, what everybody does uh, here for the foundation, all the donations that you make, everything that just makes a difference. And if you, you, know, you want to know what, what difference is made, walk around the museum, go out on the battlefield and look at what this foundation has done, what the National Park Service does. You can't do it without a partner. You're stronger to do it together. And so I'm honored to be here. I want to thank you all very much for coming to this presentation. And hopefully you'll go away with another interesting story that you didn't know about the Battle of Gettysburg. Thanks very much.